Welcome to another edition of Showtime with Coop. Insightful BS with my Laker teammates, NBA legends, and the Laker family in whole. And today we got Stu Lance. Stu, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing really well, thank you. And you? I am wonderful, Stu. Wonderful, wonderful. You know what? Usually I take our guests through a, a kind of like a timeline, walk back through in the early days, but we're not going to do that. We're going to get right to the point with you. Stu, what brought you into broadcasting? You know, that's an interesting question because I, I didn't major in journalism at all in college. I should be teaching grade school. I, my, my degree is in elementary education. Wow. So when I retired, I looked forward to going into the teaching uh, profession. But a friend of mine said that he thought I might be uh, pretty good at uh, being an analyst for, for basketball. And I told him he was crazy. But he said, what's the harm in trying? Uh, CBS is looking and that's who was doing the NBA games at that time. It was a regional broadcast. Each region had a game on Sunday. So there were five games a day back in the old day. And so I auditioned and they selected me. I started working for them for that year. And then from there on, I, I've been doing it. You know, Sue, you had probably one of the best jobs other than being a former player. I mean, you were a great player when you played, but the best jobs of a career after basketball, because you got to work with the voice. And what I mean by that, the voice is the voice of the Lakers, Chick Hearn, one of the, the best uh, announcers. I remember going back to when I was a young man, when we had black and white TV, kids now today can't even imagine black and white, but we had black and white TV and Chick Hearn brought color to the black and white uh, game when you just heard him talk. He was so eloquent about it, so knowledgeable. If there was one more I might say, and I hate to say his name because he's, he reminds me of that dreaded team we hated so much, Boston Celtics, but Johnny Most was another great one. But you had the, 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 the beautiful task of working with Chick Hearn. Tell us a little bit about Chick the man. Well, let me tell you, first of all, correct you on, you said one of the best. Chick was the, the best. best. There was okay, there, I take that, As far as basketball was concerned, nobody was better uh, than Chick Hearn. So he was the guy, and Chick was the, was the man. And when you talked about basketball and the uh, just the language that everybody has grown up listening and speaking about basketball, Chick started it all. He, he was just way beyond in, in the field. You know, still, you know, I remember Chick and I loved him so much. Uh, one of my favorite things about Chick and again here, we kind of like talk a little crazy sometimes, but nothing too crazy, but it's some BS. But the one thing I loved about Chick after a game when we were on the road, Chick would do such a great job as interviews, but he would always get to the airlines before the players. So as we got in, you know, Chick, uh, he, 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 we wind down in our own way and Chick would have a couple. And after a while, he starts saying, you fuckers, come on and get on this plane so we can get out of here. To the <laughs> <laughs> Next stop. What is one of your favorite stories about Chick? I always loved that. I used to laugh and he said, Coop, what you laughing about? Go sit down so we can get this plane on the road. Uh, what a funny thing that Chick would, would do for you. Well, I mean, there were so many moments with that man that just but just cracked me up so bad that uh, it's hard to singleize it. But then, you know, he, he had no patience. And that's why you're talking about he would get to the airport before everybody. And he had no patience. He was ready to go. I mean, when he got there and if the pilot was there, he was ready to take <laughs> off. And then we have to remind him that, you know, the we can't do anything at the next city if the players aren't here. And uh, then he would kind of <laughs> he would kind of say, oh, OK, we'll wait on a couple of them. But we got to get going here because he had absolutely no patience at all. You mentioned no, he's the we, best. You mentioned he's the best ever. What made him so good? Oh, wow. I mean, he, he was just a one of a kind. I mean, the way he, his wit. I mean, when you're doing live and you, you hear about all this reality television, there's only one reality TV, and that's sports. All the rest of this stuff is scripted. I don't care what they tell you. It's pretty much scripted. But sports is live. And Chick was so good at just the live action. Some mm -hmm. of the terminology that he would just invent right on the spur of the moment. And then it became a lexicon in the, in the broadcasting business. So uh, that's, that's something that just set him apart from everybody else. You know what, Stu, and I'm glad you said that because the one thing I'll always remember about the great Chick Hearn was uh, the way that he could bring the game to people, whether it be visually or, or audio by listening. And one of the things my wife, uh, my 
former wife, uh, before I, you know, uh, Wanda, he said one thing about me. He goes, um, Coop is like linoleum. He's all over the floor. <laughs> and when I heard that, man, I just busted out and started laughing because who else would say something that brilliant, that stimulating, that, that visually stimulating to get you into the game on how I was playing at that particular moment? Yeah, I mean, and he, I don't think he practiced at home trying to come up with these things. I think they were all spur of the moment type uh, things yeah. that came out of his brain. Now, I mean, that's something that it takes a rare talent to be able to do things like that. And he was just, he was just remarkable. I had the privilege of working, as you said, I worked 15 years with that man, twice wow. as long as anybody else. I remember when I first started, everyone said, well, this is something that's only going to last a half a year. <laughs> because they didn't feel, they felt the chicken and I were like oil and water. Uh, I was obviously something that he had never worked with before. Uh, he had been used to working with people that were kind of like uh, laid back and just, you know, agreed with everything that he said. And uh, I, that wasn't me. And, uh, you know, that first year was, it was kind of rocky at times, but uh, I give all the credit to Chick for making sure that the relationship worked. And uh, it worked from then. And as I said, for 15 years after that. Yeah, I was going to say, were you ever afraid to be yourself because here's this legend, even at that time, that you're walking into work with? And so were you concerned, like, I got to make sure I keep my job, <laughs> you know? Well, no, I, I never, that never entered my mind. I mean, again, if, if, it's, if it's you, you, it's really easy to be you. It's hard for, to me to be right. somebody so I didn't think about, oh, I'm going to lose my job. I just thought about uh, this is the way I broadcast. So, uh, sure, there were times where he would get mad, but he wouldn't stay mad that long. You know, and I think the people before me may have been afraid of losing their job or making him mad. But that's something that never entered my mind. I mean, I just thought it was everybody has a point of view. And you don't always agree with the person that you're speaking with. And if you're afraid to give your side of the story, you shouldn't be in that business or you shouldn't be talking to those people. So uh, that's something that I grew up with. And I, I took that uh, to heart and I continue doing that today. Hey, you listen to Showtime with Coop podcast. We have Stu Lance, something that I get to uh, put the shoe on the other foot. Usually he's interviewing me and asking me questions. I get to ask the great Stu Lance questions and I'm enjoying this to the max. You know, uh, Stu, we lost Chick a while back there and he was the voice of the Lakers. And now with the new upcoming generations and the way things are, you are now considered the voice of the Lakers. How does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel good that people kind of associate me with Chick to begin with. You know, there's still times till today that I'll be walking on the street or something and <laughs> somebody will say, hey, Chick, I mean, Stu. I mean, so and that kinda, it kind of really gives me, it's a compliment to me that they associate me with Chick Hearn. Uh, I tell all the people that I've worked with prior, after Chick that uh, no disrespect, just be yourself because you're not going to be able to fill those shoes. There's <laughs> nobody that's going to be able to fill those shoes. So let's just go out, have some fun and be ourselves. And uh, that's what we've tried to do. What you are know, some of your, we, go ahead, Ari. What are some of your greatest memories calling Laker games? Wow. Um, <laughs> There's so many great moments in Laker history that, uh, you know, and this is my, this going into my 35th season with the Lakers. So I've got uh, an overload of things, but, you know, I think success is always something that stands out in your, in your head. But I think when I think about the history of the game and the history of the Lakers, the one thing that always stands out to me is the moment that Chick made uh, a, a comeback. When I say a comeback, he had some health problems and everyone didn't think he was going to be able to come back. But when he came back and did that first game after having heart problems and things, I, I thought that was uh, something that would always stick wow. with me. Wow. Didn't he have a record of like 3,850? <laughs> yeah, he did 3,000 at that time. 3, 000, yeah, Coop, 3,338 consecutive games. Uh, that's just unheard of. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there. No, no, don't get me wrong. There were games in there that there was no way he should have been broadcasting. Yeah, uh, I agree he, with that. He was sick. He wasn't feeling well. I mean, there were two times during uh, my tenure with him that at halftime of games, uh, he had to go off the air because he was that ill. Uh, I did the second half of the game as a play-by-play, -play, and the first one was a game at the Forum. 
And uh, I asked Magic to come up and be the analyst. And Magic did that. And then the second time it happened, we were in San Antonio and Derek Fisher happened to be injured. And I asked Derek to be uh, the analyst wow. for the second half. But there were uh, many games before that, that uh, the guy was a true, uh, he was a true legend when it comes to going to work hurt. I mean, playing in pain. You know, you, you talk about some of these players that get a fractured little finger or break their toenail and they can't play. That, that wasn't Chick. I mean, no matter That's what the situation was, seasons. he was going to get the job done. And there wasn't no load management, Stu? I mean, did he have load management? <laughs> load management? Are you kidding me? Don't bring no load management up to me, man. I don't want to talk about load management. I mean, I don't mind. I hate load that, Stu. Hey, cool, cool, cool. I don't mind load management if you're in your 20th season. Yeah. But we've got guys that are 23 years old talking about load management. You have got to be joking me. <laughs> That's a disrespect to the game. I'm glad you get as riled as I do about that because we talk about that quite often. But uh, still, we're at the point now of the show where I have something I call Coop's Lightning Round. I'm going to give you five names and you give us as much information as you want to about these people, okay? First Good one, luck. Bill Sharman. Oh, Bill Sharman, one of my most famous people of all time. I, I mean, I played uh, briefly for Bill with the Lakers, uh, but this is a guy that uh, just, when you talk about true humans, I mean, this guy was truly something special and he brought all of his coaching talents, mixed those with his obvious talents as a person. And that's why he was as successful as he was. Uh, Stu, he gave so much to the game that he gave his voice. Because yeah. then later on after that, I mean, it was hard to understand Bill, but I could understand everything he said. But that's how much he loved the game of basketball. Sitting on the sidelines screaming at us when we were making mistakes. And it cost oh, so him. you did it, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The it, was, it, cost him, it cost him his voice. You know, we joke about it now. But as you said, you know, uh, that's something that we look back on. And I, I wish to obviously wish that uh, he wouldn't have lost his voice to that degree because he had so much to say. But yeah. as after he lost his voice, he kind of got uh, off the, away from the court. He got kind of quiet. You know, he didn't. I don't think he felt comfortable with the way his voice sounded. Mm. Wilt Chamberlain. Oh, the big fella. <laughs> One of the nicest people you want to meet, though, Coop. Uh, this guy, I remember as <laughs> we back in the old days, we used to play double headers, especially in the preseason. We'd have four teams play double headers. And, you know, one time the, uh, the Wilt was uh, playing in the second game. So he, he sees us before the first game and he says, you guys have got to cheer for me when we, when we come out because nobody likes the big guys. You know, that's, you know, back when the big guys were villains and he, he didn't get a whole lot of cheers. So he'd say, you guys better cheer for me. Uh, but he, he was something special. The other thing I remember about that big fella, you know, you know, you call a timeout and the ball boys would bring you some Gatorade. I looked down the bench and he's drinking a, a quart of seven up or something. I mean, like, big fella, how are you doing this and going out and playing? <laughs> and he would play 48 minutes. I mean, didn't come out of game. One year he averaged 48.5 minutes per game. And that obviously meant that he played in a lot of the overtimes as well. Hey, wow. Stu, there's a story going around that uh, uh, Bill Sharman one day, that's how we got shoot around, uh, was when they used to come in early <laughs> And Wilt was smoking a cigarette, and he asked Bill, he said, Coach, do you want it now or do you want it tonight? Because you only get it once. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey Coop, that's, that's a true story, man. Sharman told me that story. He said that he called this shoot around, and Wilt said, Bill, I'm only going to the arena one time today. So you can have me at the shoot around, or you can have me at game time, but I'm only going to the arena once. <laughs> Well, I guess when you when you got uh, twenty thousand uh, women under your belt, I guess it takes its toll on you. But Wilt was a great man and a great person. Uh, next one, Stu Magic Johnson. Oh wow! You know, you hear a lot of a lot of people talk about uh, team players and leaders. There, <laughs> just like Chick Hearn, Magic Johnson sets himself apart when it comes to being a leader and a team player. This guy, he, he made people around him feel like they were uh, the best that ever played the game. I mean, if you were around Magic for five minutes, you thought you were king of the world because he was that type of a person. He could instill that kind of confidence in you as a player, as a, as a broadcaster, whatever the case may be. And that's why people that met Magic felt like they met him for the first time, but they, oh, I think feels like I've, met, I've known Magic Johnson all my life. 
Yeah. Uh, last but not least, the late great Kobe Bryant. Wow. Uh, that that's that's a special guy in his own way. Um, when you talk about work ethic, uh, there is nobody that I know that had the same type of work ethic that uh, that Kobe had. Uh, you know, he came into the league, especially after his rookie year or second year. A lot of people just looked upon him as uh, a guy that shot the ball all the time. He touched it. But Kobe, you know, if he trusted you as a player, he gave you the basketball. Yeah. But if he didn't think that he you would make the shot, he would take the shot over two or three guys. But there were a lot of players that he trusted with that ball. And uh, the guy was just, he was just something special. And I, I think the younger generation today kind of capsulizes it. You see some of, so many of the young stars today that are referring to Kobe as a mentor, as a guy that they look up to uh, when they were coming up and a guy that they're trying to emulate uh, today uh, that says that says a lot about what uh, Kobe Bryant gave to the game of basketball and what he gave to the, the game of life because uh, he, he was special off the court as well do you remember well, Kobe was go ahead sorry do you remember when he first came over I mean you're calling the Laker games like what were your first impressions of him when did you realize like oh he's the real deal well, I mean, I, I kind of respected the, the, the opinion of Jerry West. And uh, I guess that summer before they got him, uh, he had a workout with some guy named Michael Cooper, I guess. I don't know. Hey, Stu, uh, wait a minute now. I got the best of Kobe. Kobe didn't take me to the hoop every time. <laughs> but hey, Cooper, I didn't say he did. But listen, I didn't see the workout. But Jerry told me that that was the best workout he's ever seen. Wow. From a, you know, a guy coming in as a rookie the best workout he'd ever seen. So that right there told me that this young man had some skill. And when I saw Kobe in preseason, uh, he, he lived up to the bill. The one thing that I liked about Kobe, we had a, this is during the regular season, his rookie year. We're in Detroit and we're, ha we're at practice and the second team, he was on the second team, obviously then, and they're scrimmaging against the first team and the first team beat him. Kobe goes over on the other side of the court and you can see the tears coming out of his eyes. He was that upset about losing a little scrimmage in a practice. That told me right there, this guy's a winner. He hated losing. Well, you know, it's still reminding me of Magic. I mean, you know, I saw Magic, but Magic used to hate losing in games, even if he had to cheat sometimes. And he was a big cheater, but most of the time he was pretty good. So I understand where you're coming from with that. Uh, you listen to Showtime with Coop podcast. We have Stu Lance in the house. Uh, Stu, last thing about Chick. Chick, Chick had his Chickisms. What are your Stuisms? I don't have any Stuisms, man. <laughs> come on, Stu, you gotta come up with one, baby. No <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. You, you have you ever listened to the games that I broadcast? <laughs> I have. Yes, I have. And you know what? I always say Stu can stick something special there, but you never do because you're so professional. You have integrity and love for the game that you call it the way it is. But the next time. The next time I see or hear that you can do it, I'm going to write you a note. Or actually, I'm going to text you and say, Stu, next time, this is what you can use. Or okay, maybe I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Or maybe he's so synonymous with Lakers now that he's saying Stuisms. You just are not picking him up because you're just so used to hearing his voice called Lakers games. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Stu is great, man. In my eyes, he calls it the way he sees it. Stu, talk about the current Lakers. By the way, today. you don't get to call Laker games as long as he has unless you're great. That's such well, a great job. Great. So that's why, for sure. Stu, Stu is not great. He's legendary. There He's going to go. go down. There you go. Well, go you, you, you got to remember, legendary just means you're old. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't be a legend in one year. <laughs> well, Stu, we do have something in common. Both of us are bald, so I like that. So I think I'm, we're in the same uh, area with that. But Stu, talk about today's Lakers. Do you like this Laker team this year? The assemblement uh, of it? Yes, I do. I really do. I mean, the, the key is like with every team every year, can they keep their health? And when you've got the, the mileage on them that they do, that's something that may have some concern for me. But if they can, with the depth that they have on paper, if they can utilize that depth so that they don't overuse some of their veterans, so to speak, uh, I think they're going to be okay. But the key is going to be health, especially to that big twosome of LeBron and Anthony Davis. 
No, for sure. And I think I love the addition of bringing Dwight Howard back. I don't know why he ever got out of L.A. Because he and JaVale McGee, and I tell people this, is the reason why A.D. was able to last as long as he did when they were in the bubble. Yeah, you know what? Uh, there were three things at the end, of, not even the end, at the end of the year, three things last season that I thought the Lakers needed. One of which, one of which was uh, really rim protection in the center. And I think they've addressed that, bringing back Dwight. I thought they needed perimeter defense. You know, they had yeah, this yeah. they had this thing about uh, thinking that Caruso was going to be that guy. Caruso was a good defender, but he was, in my mind, a better team defender than yeah. an individual defender. He wasn't a Michael Cooper who was uh, like that tile that just was all over the place. Yeah. You know, and while we're speaking of Michael Cooper, before we get going here and, I, and you get, cut me off, I want to say it publicly again that you go down in my book as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, defensive player to ever play because you played defense on four or five different positions. And people that don't play don't know how hard that is. To, you know, you can lock up one guy, you know, if it's a point guard, yeah, I can get him. But now you go over to that, that big shooting guard or that small forward or, or back in the day when you played, there were guys called power forwards. Today, there's no power forwards. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> six, five, six, six, eight. Come on. Right. Centers are playing at six, eight. There's no real physicality to the game. So they don't try to take advantage of the size differential that they tried to do with you. So, uh, and, and I think uh, if you don't believe me, believe Larry Bird, who said that uh, you were the toughest guy, you were the toughest guy he had to go against. Thank you, Stu. That's, that's nice words from you. Uh, and just stand on that track for a minute about the best defensive players. Who would you consider a good uh, two? Give me two names of good defensive players in today's game. Wow. Uh, wow. I'm going to throw one at you, and I, I really like this young man, Draymond Green. What do you think of him? Well, yeah, I, I definitely think Draymond is one of those because that's his forte. Aside from being a facilitator, yeah. his yeah. forte is d defending, and he defends again. Uh, it doesn't matter. That's why when they're healthy, defensively, they can get it done because they play a five-man – they can switch every position because Draymond – you don't have to worry about him switching out on pick and rolls against that small guard because Draymond yeah. can go out there and guard them. So, uh, yeah, he, he's one of those that can do that. But there are a lot of uh, two-way players out there that uh, I, I like. I mean, you know, prior to the uh, injury to his knee this season, again, you've got a guy like Kawhi Leonard, I yeah. thought, was really a defender. I remember Kawhi at San Diego State when he was in college. I thought he was going to be an all-defensive team in the NBA for 10 consecutive years. Never envisioned that he would develop into the offensive player that uh, he has developed into. So he's one of those uh, good two-way players. But there are a number of players in the NBA that, uh, believe it or not, can play some defense. So I'm going to say it right here. It'll be our last question for you. And I'm putting myself out there now. And again, I think it's going to be on what Coach Vogel do as far as pulling that chemistry and keeping that team together. And again, the biggest point you made, if they're healthy, the Lakers are going to win the championship this year. Can I get you on my fan wagon? <laughs> Way to go out on that limb. I like it when guys go out on that limb early. Don't wait until it's the fourth game of the finals and the Lakers are up three to three to one. Exactly. Three zip and then say they're going to win. Go out there early. Uh, and I kind of agree with you, Coop. I think if the, the and the key word is health. If they can stay healthy, they've got the ingredients uh, to really get it done because their depth, uh, you know, people are talking about bringing in Carmelo Anthony. I think Carmelo is going to be an asset to this team because he has adjusted to his role. I really believe he's going to be a big asset. He's going to be able to spell Le LeBron, say, give LeBron more rest at that position. And uh, I just think that they can get the job done. There you have it. Now y'all know I'm not crazy because Stu Lance has agreed with me as long as the Lakers <laughs> say that might be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Stu, thank you so much, man. Anything else you want to say? Any platforms you want that you want to give something out to them? To our fans? No, I just Again, I just want everyone to remember uh, the game wasn't invented uh, five years ago. Uh, don't forget about the history of the game. Don't forget about the players that I've mentioned, including the host of the Showtime with Coop. Because, uh, Coop, you, you, I, and I've said it before, you just didn't get the credit uh, that you deserve. But everybody wants to look at a box score and see 30 points on the scoreboard to see how the guys contributed to a victory. But uh, the guys that contribute to victories are more or less the guys that don't show up with the big numbers in the scoreboard but do all the other big things. There's no little things 
in basketball. You hear people say, oh, he, he does all the little things. There ain't no little things in basketball. When you're defending, <laughs> that ain't no little thing. When you're rebounding, that ain't no little thing. Getting the job done. So my, my hat's off to you, Coop. Uh, I know I've told you before, and I'll, I'll continue to sing your praises. Thank you, Stu. And you know what? I'm going to say this before we leave, and we'll leave after this. In 1994-7, I was going through my trials and tribulations after I retired. I didn't know what I was going to do, and I had some ups and downs. I was going through a, a, a divorce with my wife, first wife. And Stu, I'll never, ever forget you saying this. You know, you saw me one day over at the Lakers office. You said, Coop, you all right? I said, Stu, I'm... He, and you told me, you said, Mike, be quiet. All you have to do is stay the course and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and things are going to turn out all right. And Stu, I, I, you probably don't remember that. But that has stuck to my heart, man. And that's why I always have reached out to you and wished well for you. And I pray for you and your family every single night. But those words right there pulled me through a real tough time in my life. And I just want to thank you for that, sir. Oh, I appreciate that, Coop. And again, uh, it's called uh, passing it along. You know, if you can help someone, help someone. Uh, no. Regardless of what their scenario may be, if you can be some sort of a helping hand, be a helping hand. You were mine, Stu. Love you, man. Thank you Love very you too, much, man. Stu. Thank you. Stu oh, Lance, you everybody. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Stu. Okay. Okay. Talk to you soon.